Good morning, everybody. Um, we are uh, a couple of minutes early, I think, regarding the start of the talk this morning. So I'm just, I know we have a, a lot of people already in uh, attending, so that's wonderful. Um, I'm just going to give it a few more minutes and then we'll uh, kick off. Um, I'm, I'm Professor Carola Dillenberger. I'm the director of the Center for Behavior Analysis. Um, and uh, I'll give you a reintroduction to the center in just a moment. So uh, we have got everybody here. And it's, it's nice to see some people. Uh, oh, there's Katarina. That's nice. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll um, <laughs> thanks, Alan. Um, it's lovely to see everybody and people starting to um, to arrive. I'm going to make a, a start just with the introduction to the center and uh, the introduction to, to Jane, because uh, to our first speaker. So an official welcome to the fifth conference of the, of the Center for Behavior Analysis. This is the first time we meet virtually, um, which is obviously a sign of the times. Um, in the past, we have had uh, the other four conferences on campus, and maybe someday, hopefully, we'll be able to do that again. The conference this time is entitled uh, Applied Behavior Analysis, Meaningful Inclusion in a Changing World. And we had quite some uh, debate about the title uh, of the conference, and uh, we had a, a vote, and we felt that that meaningful inclusion in a changing world would be best reflecting our uh, theme this morning, uh, today, all day. We have some fantastic uh, keynote speakers and, uh, and uh, paper sessions. The Center for Behavior Analysis at the School of Edu uh, Social Sciences, Education and Social Work at C uh, Queen's University, Belfast, is an international research center with associations from across our university and other national and international universities and research centers and the local and international community. The center is based on a philosophy of inclusion and evidence-based in effective education and person-centered research and practice. Our mission is to provide knowledge and skills that improve confidence and competence and lead to improvements for individuals, families, and caregivers, and society as a whole. We conduct a research into a range of topics related to education, pedagogy, curriculum, and learning across the lifespan. We offer the master in ABA that includes an uh, Course, uh, verified course sequence by uh, the Association for Behavior Analysis International. And we also offer a master's in autism spectrum disorders that focuses on autism in children and adults specifically. Both courses can be accessed from anywhere in the world online. We also offer RBT level training. We conduct a range of research activities related to all a range of issues um, related to ABA. I'm delighted to welcome to the con you to the conference. A big thanks go to the conference chair, Dr. Katarina Donavi, and the conference committee, including Dr. Nicola Booth and Dr. Devon Raimi. Uh, I'm delighted, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to the first speaker, Jane McCready. Jane was a UK Society for Behaviour Analysis board member and chair of their cons consumer advisory board for many years, and she remains an advisory board member. She initiated the ABA Access for All campaign that has featured in the media regularly and helped many parents and children. Her talk will focus on, her, uh, on the 16 years of kind and effective ABA teaching that her 19-year-old son, uh, Johnny, received, who is autistic and uh, has learning disabilities, and who has experienced ABA-based interventions at home and uh, in both mainstream and now special ABA schools. The skills he's learned have helped him to improve the quality of life and the fun and important parts of his life. Indeed, improved his health outcomes, as he also has uh, two lifelong health conditions. Jane firmly believes that without ABA, her son would ha have a much poorer quality of life. Thank you very much, Jane, for coming today. And over to you. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? 
and hopefully see a picture of my beautiful son in the little window, can you? Lovely, thank you very much. Um, I think that's a brilliant title for a conference, Meaningful Inclusion in a Changing World, and I think that's precisely what ABA has given Johnny. And I think not to put too fine a point on it, if I, if I hadn't started ABA when he was three, I think he'd be in um, a secure residential home now. And that would break my heart and his heart and all our family's hearts. So I thank you to the ABA profession. And I'm going to start off just by introducing Johnny, who's on the screen here. Here he is. He's holding, as you see, a hippo toy and an iPad. He's always holding something. And the hippo toy was his favourite for quite a while, although not now, actually. The hippo's gone out of fashion. Um, he is a beautiful, sunny-natured boy or man now, I guess. He's age 19. He has four disabilities, and I'll just go through them so that you know um, teaching him was not easy. Um, he has severe autism. I don't know whether you want to call it profound autism or level three autism or high support needs autism, but it's the severe kind. And I have a um, level one autistic stepdaughter too, who lives an independent life and has a career and is about to get married. So I kind of know the difference between level one and level three in my own family. He also has a severe learning disability, and unlike most in the UK, it's actually a diagnosed severe learning disability. We took him to the Maudsley in London when he was three and then again at five. So he has an actual diagnosis of a severe learning disability with an average measured IQ approximation under 50. And as you know, under 70 is where learning disability kicks in. He has a congenital heart defect, as do I, actually. We were both born with a hole in our heart, which is actually, ironically, the least of our problems. And then just to add to the party, at age 10, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, uh, as if we weren't having enough fun. That came along. And that's the type 1 diabetes that requires five injections of insulin into his tongue for the rest of his life, for him to stay alive not type 2 diabetes, uh, which is often confused, which is the one that you get older in life if you're a little bit overweight. So with all of those four disabilities, I speak for Johnny both practically and legally. I applied for and got deputyship for him, so I legally speak for his experience because he doesn't have the ability to understand risk or to manage decisions in his own life, and therefore my husband, my daughter and I hold deputyship for him. Um, we always want Johnny to live at home with us. He's our beautiful boy and we want him to be at home with us as long as I'm this side of the ground, frankly. I know other people make different decisions, but for me, that's where we are. I couldn't bear to put him in residential. I couldn't bear to think of him manding mummy soon or home soon. Um, he wants to stay at home. We want him to stay at home. But the corollary of that, as we, his parents, head into our 60s, is that we need him to learn as many skills of independence as possible. There's going to come a time with my arthritis and my neck and, you know, all the things that come with age that I literally won't be able to do things for him, even if I wanted to. I won't be able to cut his toenails or dry between his toes. He needs to learn to do that stuff himself. And that's where ABA has come in. And it's really transformed his life in, I guess, seven key areas, which I'm going to go through. The first is communication, key. The second is reading and writing, although I suppose we should probably call it texting or online shopping or typing nowadays in today's world. The third is self-help skills, absolutely crucial for dignity and health. Um, the fourth is challenging behaviour, that's a big one, learning to self-edit his responses to life's inevitable stresses, the only sustainable way to manage challenging behaviour, I'll come back to that. And then work skills, because you, you can't just go swimming for the rest of your life, you, you need to have some meaningful occupation. And then the last two categories are fun, the fun stuff in life, and sport. Teenage boys need sport, I'm a sister of two brothers, they need sport. So let's start at the beginning with communication. Um, Johnny would not now be speaking if it were not for ABA. And I can say that with some authority because when he was about three, we employed a private SALT speech and language therapist to work with him for hours and hours, quite expensive to pay for it privately, but there was nothing available on the state. And after about six months working with him, I sat with her in the kitchen and she had a sad face and she said, 
I'm sorry to tell you, but I don't think Johnny will ever talk. We'd best try signs and pecks. She was the professional, so I kind of accepted that. Um, I think looking back, she was probably using pecks erroneously. And I wonder how many people in the UK are using it erroneously. She was using it as a alternative to spoken speech rather than a precursor. And I can remember wasn't very interested in eliciting any any sounds or words. So the speech therapist has said, I'm sorry, he'll never talk. Now, I, in another part of my career, was a qualified teacher. And I didn't feel that giving up on a child being able to speak at age three sat well. This is him um, actually a little bit older than three. But just so that you can see, I don't think one should give up on speech at three. So that's when I reluctantly agreed to try ABA. Why do I say reluctantly? Well, I, like many mums in the UK, had been fed a diet of myths about ABA by other mums and by professionals who frankly don't want to pay for it. So it suits them to believe the myths, even if they don't. So another mum suggested I try ABA and I said, oh, no, 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 I'll not be darkening the door of that evil ABA. I've heard it's abusive and nasty and creates little robots. Not for me, thank you. Luckily for me, she was quite blunt. She's a Russian lady. I bumped into her the other day and she said, you are talking nonsense. You have been misinformed. You must try ABA. So I thought, well, what have I got to lose? I'll, I'll give it a go. And very quickly, I saw that despite the myths, ABA is frankly a good method of teaching anything. And I could see that very quickly. One of the first things the nice ABA supervisor who turned up at my house for a home programme realised and that I hadn't realised stupidly, even though I've been a teacher, was that Johnny's autism meant he lacked the ability to imitate. The ability to imitate is key to all learning. I've got a neurotypical daughter two years older than Johnny. And of course she learned by imitating. She watched me speak. She watched grandma bake cakes. She, she learned how to read by watching me read. It was imitation. And Johnny didn't naturally imitate. So one of the first things they did, which seemed to me so simple and yet not em embraced by any other part of the autism education establishment, was to teach him to imitate. So, I mean, you'll all be familiar with this, teaching him first of all to imitate motor movements. Do this. And then after a while, teaching him that the words do this mean imitate what I'm doing. And then one magic day, moving it to mouth movements so that he learns that different mouth movements elicit different responses from the people in his life. Oh, opens up the speech center in his brain, fires up the neurons that control speech. And I don't believe speech would have come bubbling up innately with Johnny. Well, I, I could kind of see that from what the speech therapist had said. So using huge reinforcement, which in Johnny's case was his swing in the garden, which he loves, they would give him lots of big pushes and then do this, push, push, waiting. Now, of course, at first he didn't say push, he said, P -p -p -p. but you get the reward of the big push on the swing. And then you work painstakingly and patiently to shape into push. And then you, of course, don't want him to think that push is the only word in the world. You need him to learn that other mouth movements and shapes get him different results. So you need to teach him crisps and car and school and mummy. And all these different words get him different results and different outcomes. So you're opening up. I, I could see it happening, that the speech centers of his brain being opened up by this relatively sim simple man training technique, which yet the UK doesn't embrace for others who haven't found ABA. Absolute craziness to me. Then of course you have to move from just single words so that he doesn't just use single words. You try and extend his speech into little phrases. You try and clarify his speech because he would have a tendency to drop the ends of words. Toilet rather than toilet. So he still does sometimes not say things clearly. It's a constant ongoing quest to clarify and extend his speech. But now Johnny speaks in five word phrases. You know, he, he doesn't speak as I do. He's severely autistic, as we remember, and severely learning disabled. But he can communicate his needs. And moreover, we are moving on to social use of speech, conversation as a goal. Um, one of the wonderful things they're working on at his ABA school is him leaving voice notes for me. Mummy, I do cooking at school. 
Now, voice notes are all the rage with the youngsters. I know we oldies all think it's about text, but no, the youngsters can't be bothered with text. It's all about the voice note. So for Johnny to be able to do voice notes is incredible and really nice. And so we're working on conversation, extending his speech, clarifying his speech. He can use five word phrases. Um, the other day I heard him in the hall trying on some new shoes saying too small to himself. Now that may not sound much to people, particularly if you have neurotypical kids, but for me, that was a real triumph because that's him using commentary and explaining to me that the shoes feel too small, which I've been trying to get him to understand in Clark's shoe shop for so many years, and now he's telling me, and then the Velcro needed extending. And also, when we come on to type 1 diabetes, um, life-saving language, if he learns to say, I need juice, and he's not around people who understand type 1 diabetes, that, that three-word phrase could literally save his life. So then the second skill I talked about was reading and writing. And I can remember in the early days of ABA and then ABA alongside mainstream school and then in an ABA specific school, which he's still at, at Beyond Autism, thinking, what's the point of this, Dr you know, dredging over phonics, oh, 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 pa, 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 learning to read them, learning to say them. And then, oh, God, you've got to do the capital letters, too. And the capital R looks completely different from the capital and learning that. There's a letter sound, R, and a letter, or whichever it is, R and R. Anyway, all that complexity and thinking, what's this all for? Well, now I really do understand what it was all for. It's not about Johnny ever being able to read Hamlet or, you know, Proust. It's about real functional skills, being able to type and read. Quite often now, John and my husband and I can hear Johnny playing with his iPad and saying, Tuh. Yeah, space, s, t, o, r, yeah. I don't know how many of you've got that, but that's Toy Story. That's Johnny putting Toy Story into YouTube to find his favourite videos. So he's in control of what he wants to watch. Or sometimes we hear him. Let's see if you can get this one. S, k, o, o, b, yeah, space, d. Scooby-Doo, he's searching for his favourite Scooby-Doo films. And then, of course, it's not just about searching for videos on YouTube, it's about buying stuff on Amazon. He's now got his own Amazon account at school and he can buy toy caterpillars, t o y space, caterpillars. But they're also starting to work on him doing an online Sainsbury shop, because if you can type in ham, then you can, with the pictures, choose the kind of ham you like, same with bread. So. Reading, writing, typing are real functional skills, particularly in today's online world. And when we were teaching him phonics, I didn't really realise that was how it was going to be and that he was going to be always carrying an iPad and that that was going to be key to so much of his life and his fun and his shopping and his needs. So I'm very glad we persevered with those early phonics. Moving on to self-help. Well, of course, um, the biggest self-help skills that we all learn when we're little is toileting and using ABA techniques. You know, there's no magic wand. It took six months breaking the task down, practicing the task, mastering the task. But he is now completely independent toileting wherever we are. And that's really important for his dignity as much as anything else. Dressing himself, putting on his own shoes and socks. My arthritis can't bend down to put on his own socks. It's really hard to put on someone's socks when they're an adult. So teaching him to do his own socks, teaching him to wash himself, teaching him to dry himself after the shower. When you all um, go home tonight or tomorrow to have your shower, I bet when you dry yourself, you have a little chain and you do it exactly the same without even thinking about it. I bet you dry yourself in the same order every day. Have a little look next time you do it. But for Johnny, that, that had to be taught step by step. It wasn't like with my daughter, show her once and she's going to learn it back to his four disabilities. It's gonna take patient, careful, micro teaching. And obviously this is something the ABA school couldn't do because it's private. So I drew up my own little chain, here it is on the screen, and put it on the wall in the shower for years. And he would copy and imitate. Well, now it's no longer needing to be on the wall in the shower because he does dry himself completely independently and he still does it in this order. It's become innate after practice. Practice makes perfect. Um, 
then learning to tolerate all the health checks that we all have to put up with in life. The dentist, the foot doctor, he has a whole roster of health checks because of his type 1 diabetes. Here he is in the dentist chair. You know, none of us like the dentist, but you kind of have to tolerate it, otherwise your teeth fall out. Um, learning about shaving, which we did through imitating daddy, back to those imitation skills. Learning about putting on deodorant, pretty important in a teenage boy who's very hyperactive. Learning about private time. There are some things that are fine to do, but you need to be doing them in the privacy of your own room by yourself with the door shut. That's a big one for a teenage boy. Nothing wrong with it at all, but there's a time and a place. Um, and then I guess the biggest health skill of all that Johnny had to learn was to do his own insulin injections. Uh, when we were told at age 10 that he was going to need five injections of insulin in his tummy every day for the rest of his life, it was a big blow, as you can imagine. And this was a child who was needle phobic. On previous occasions, when we had to have um, blood taken from him, it had taken five people to hold him down. The screaming, people thought we were torturing him. The floor of the bay for the um, blood test was covered in blood. The doctors all had white faces. This boy was terrified of needles. Um, so when he was gonna need five injections in his tummy a day, from the age 10 to live, it was a massive blow. And for many years, I did it myself. And it really is horrible as a mum having to inject your own child. It goes against all instinct, but I had to do it. And one day, uh, one lovely day, the BCBA, Sophia, at his school, Beyond Autism, said to me, I think we'll try and teach Johnny to do his own injections. And I thought, yeah, right, cut back to the guy, the boy in the booth with the blood all over the floor and the five people holding him down. This is never going to happen. And um, but I thought, well, what have I got to lose? Let them give it a try. And now I'm going to show a little video of Johnny doing his own insulin jabs. Spurt of two, good boy. Now turn it to three. Three. Let mommy check. Good boy. Good boy. One, two, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, nine, ten. ten. Good boy. Yeah, yeah, pin. Yeah, yeah, pin, yep. Boy. Boy. So there you go, that's Johnny, the previously needle phobic uh, child, doing his own insulin jabs, which he still to, to this day does five times a day with insouciance and flair. And it doesn't seem to hurt him so much, which is good for my mother's heart. Um, but ABA is not sorcery. You all who are professionals know that. This was a painstaking, skilled piece of patient teaching that took six months. And I'm going to show you on the next photo the, I'm not sure what you call this thing, um, the list of steps that they taught him to mastery, gradual stimulus response data sheet, I think you call it. And so over six months, they would teach him each step painstakingly till mastery go back on it, backward chaining, forward chaining. You know, one of the first steps was simply taking the little lid off the needle. Here, I'm doing it here. And that would be taught for a week. And then putting the needle on the pen and, and so on and so on. So that took six months. But I think if you can teach that to a severely autistic boy with a severe learning disability in IQ under 50, it shows what a good teaching method you were dealing with with ABA. And we've applied the same teaching techniques to all sorts of health checks that Johnny needs. Poor boy has so many health checks. Squeezy arm, he was terrified of. That's having your blood pressure taken. If you don't understand the why of squeezy arm, you think that that damn cuff is going to squeeze, cap on, keep on squeezing until your arm explodes. So we had to teach him that it was going to stop and that he could tolerate it. He has to have ECGs for his heart. Vaccinations, um, that was another one. A lot of people thought, well, vaccinations will be a doddle for Johnny because he injects himself in the tummy five times a day. 
No, I'm afraid not. To Johnny, being vaccinated by a strange doctor in Kingston University Hospital is a completely different skill set than injecting his own tummy and a very frightening one. And again, at the ABA school that he goes to, they broke the task down, they practiced the task using a fake injection, they practiced it to mastery. And he's recently just had his COVID and flu boost boosters very, very well. Um, does it fantastically. It turns out the absolute key behavior in tolerating a vaccine is keep your arm still, because if you keep your arm still, everything's fine. And if you move at the last minute, everything is not fine. So keep your arm still was the behavior that we worked on most strongly. And he, and he had his vaccines. He's had all his vaccines. He's up to date. So moving on to challenging behavior, I think after communication, that's probably the area where I have most to thank ABA for and the area where if I'd not found ABA, Johnny would now be in some godforsaken secure residential unit. Um, ABA has given Johnny the skills to self-edit his own challenging behavior. And his challenging behavior when he was younger and sometimes still now includes aggression and self-injury. <laughs> Or even worse, <clears throat> imagine concrete surface. <clears throat> um, he would hit, he would headbutt, he would bang his head on concrete, he would bite, he would pinch, he would pinch his sister. Um, just as with the salt earlier, I had actually sent Johnny to a very prestigious teach, T-E-A-C-C-H, preschool. One that everyone had heard of and one that we had to pay for privately because there was nothing available on the state. And he'd been going to this prestigious teach preschool. Um, and because he was aggressive and biting his sister and biting his grandpa and headbutting concrete, I asked them for advice at the prestigious teach centre. What do I do when he hits me or bites his sister? And again, they got the learned face that I've come to expect from many professionals in this world and said, praise him when he's not biting you. Right, well, you don't have to be a child psychologist to know that that's not going to work. A, with a non-verbal at that time child and a child with no comprehension of even the most basic speech, a double negative wasn't going to cut it. So again, I looked to ABA and they gave me the tools and gave Johnny the tools, moreover, to self-edit his own responses to stress, such that they should not involve his fists or his head on concrete. Now, again, it's not a magic wand, it's not sorcery, it's been a hard journey of trial and error. BCBA is at his school trying things, we trying them at home, some things haven't worked, some things have worked. Building and building and building his ability to deal with life stresses. No quick fix. Um, and eventually what we've come upon is you need to sit down and you need to put your hands down with a gestural prompt. You need to sit down because I need a height advantage. He's towering over me now. He's six foot and 91 kilos. I'm not. And put your hands down for obvious reasons. And that can also, with the help of the OT, be turned into a squeeze. When you need, when you're, when you're in a mood, you need something like that. And that works quite well. Try it when you're next in a mood. Um, and the OT has helped actually working with the ABA with some deep breathing too calm yourself down when you're in a mood. And I think it, it's all very well for some of those who are very much in the PBS world to talk about changing the environment. But there are some environments you can't change. You can't, I can't not take Johnny to the dentist because he doesn't like it. I can't not put a sensor on Johnny's arm every two weeks with a needle in because he doesn't like it. I can't not take Johnny to the foot doctor because he has to get ready or feet problems can come in later life with diabetes. You can't change the environment for everything. The only thing you can really change is your response to the world. And I think, um, I'm sorry if I'm out of turn here, but I think some in the PBS world are going too far down the just change the environment line and not working enough on the child learning to tolerate the parts of life that we all have to learn to tolerate. And I think if you don't learn to tolerate some parts of life, you, you actually, in the end, it's not kindness you've created the child a prison of their own challenging behaviours. And I think often that's why they end up going into secure residential care, often in their teens when the behaviours become really bad. So it's not perfect. He still sometimes has, you know, uh, an urge to self-harm, but we've got, please put, you need to put your hands down. You need to sit down, do deep breathing, do deep breathing. 
And when you're calmer, do some squeezes. And then when you've really calmed down, do some marching to get the adrenaline out of your system. It really works that, um, to, to get adrenaline out of your system, to do some exercise or some bouncing. And the, the net result of all of that is that he is now at home with us safely. Oh, I'm trying to move on to my next photo and I can't. Why? Uh, sorry. Mm. Okay, well, I'll leave that for now. He's at home with us um, happily. He can tolerate lots of the things in life that I'm not sure he would have been able to tolerate if we hadn't done ABA. He's, um, it's the same principle for me as I didn't ever want to put earphones on him when we went out and about. If you can't tolerate babies crying or hand dries in a loo, it cuts you off some, from so much fun stuff in the world, like going to the cinema, which he loves, or out to the cafe for a latte. So I um, did not want to, I don't know if anyone can help me on this. So, uh... I'm going to share the next photo. Okay, I'll move on. So the next category is fun. So how did ABA help? Hey, it's Chris. It looks like that window doesn't have focus. Click it in your dock again. What do you mean my dock? There oh. you go. But how do I move it on? It won't move on to the next photo. You're, you're, you're clicking out of it. Click, click it in your dock again. Now, yeah, now you should be able to click in it. Ah, yeah. Yes, there we are. That's to show Johnny at home with me, happy, tolerating life as it is, not life as he would like it to be. So fun. Teaching Johnny to behave in socially appropriate ways means that the whole of the world's opened up to him, stuff that he wants to do. There are certain behaviours you simply can't do in crowded places. You can't, at 91 kilos, bounce up and down next to an old lady queuing in a restaurant. You can't shriek in a high-pitched tone when you're sitting next to a 91 year old lady on the bus you, you just can't maybe you just can't do some of these things um and in a restaurant johnny absolutely loves a restaurant dinner and there are certain things and skills you have to learn to have a restaurant dinner many of them are in the essential eight curriculum which i love the essential for living curriculum waiting is one of them you order your food then you have to wait it doesn't turn up straight away Tolerating no, if something's off the menu. Um, all these things open up your life to restaurant dinners. And the next couple of photos, here's Johnny with us and some friends. This is actually a Michelin star restaurant dinner. The first time we took him to a Michelin star restaurant dinner. I mean, I have to admit mainly he had chips. He didn't have the little bitty bitty food, but he absolutely loves a restaurant dinner and a Coke. And here's another one. This is uh, his sister, Marina, her 18th. There's Johnny enjoying the family dinner. My dad, who in fact just died, his grandpa. Um, cinema, going to the cinema. You have to learn to wait for the film. You have to sit still. You can't run around. OK, I could take him to the autism friendly cinema screening, but actually he would hate that because he wouldn't like all the noise from the other kids. Um, so we've really persevered and he can go to the cinema and watch a film. We went recently to watch the King Kong Godzilla film. He absolutely loves the cinema. Taking him to his sister's graduation. This was at Cambridge, just gone in July. There's meaningful inclusion in a changing world right there. Many people would not have taken Johnny to his sister's graduation, but we did. And he enjoyed the drinks party and he's holding, by the way, the toy caterpillars that he can now buy on Amazon. Walks along the river every Saturday for a latte. Johnny is obsessed with lattes, which is good because we are too. We've had to teach him that he he had a phobia about dogs, but we've worked so hard on that and now he's fine if they're on the lead. So we can go walk down the river and go for his beloved latte. Bus rides he loves, train rides he loves. He absolutely loves a disco. It's a myth that all autistic kids are sensory averse. He's sensory seeking, he loves a disco. And this next video that I'm going to show you, for all those who think that an ABA school must be all about sitting at a desk and touching your nose all day because they mistake ABA for DTT, this next video shows um, one of Johnny's tutors, Valentina, was, she's left now unfortunately, but she was from Colombia, and she's teaching Johnny to salsa using again those imitation skills. Watch the leg kicks. Hey, watch. 
video <laughs> so then my next category is sport teenage boys need and love sports johnny needs it because he loves sport but he also needs it for his fitness particularly given his type 1 diabetes and because there is a tendency for learning disabled folk to put on weight in later life swimming is one of johnny's great great loves and it's also a life skill um i don't know if people have seen the absolutely appalling autism drowning statistics particularly in the u.s absolutely heartbreaking it's a life skill as well as being fun and Johnny was taught swimming using pretty much ABA techniques in fact his swimming tutor was such a natural ABA -er that she later became an ABA tutor because you know teaching swimming is the same thing break down the task practice the task build it up to mastery go back repractice starting with a noodle um, he can now swim and keep himself safe in water here's the next video this is Hokan Beach. This is a private sea pool for Johnny. Johnny, do a swim. Do a swim. Swim, swim. Swim, swim. That's it. Good boy swimming. That's it. Oh, good boy. Good swimming. Swim back now. You can hear a slight tone of panic in my voice there. One of the key skills when you're letting your severely autistic and severely learning disabled son swim in a sea pool is that they must also have learned the instruction come back. And he had learned that also taught by our ABA. He also goes to a tennis club. He can serve, he can rally. We were there last night. He was doing a rally with his autistic friend. Um, we've been going there for years. Again, tennis is a sport you can teach via ABA techniques, although they're not ABA at that club. Trampolining, like most autistic kids, he absolutely loves trampolining. He's got a trampoline at home to this day. And of course, back to his swing, which is still in the garden. We've had to buy an industrial strength one now because uh, of course he's six foot and 21 kilos, um, but he still loves the swing. So that's sport. Um, coming on then to work skills. I can't just take Johnny swimming for the rest of his life. Um, after the age of 25, everything's going to stop. College is going to stop. There's going to be pretty much nothing, maybe some day centres. We need some meat on the bone for his life. And actually, he's been doing by his ABA school an internship at a marketing agency. And he's been using some of the skills that have been built up. Um, one of his key skills, which he also helps us with at home, is emptying and filling the dishwasher. He's an absolute champ at that. Well, every office nowadays has a dishwasher and no one wants to fill it and empty it. So Johnny comes in and does that. He fills their printer with paper. He fills their fruit bowls and their coffee jar. The next picture is him actually at the workplace filling up their coffee jar. And as a reward at the end of that, those tasks, he gets a Diet Coke from their Diet Coke fridge. Absolutely loves Diet Coke. So I can kind of foresee in the future maybe a, a job at a cafe where he's emptying their dishwasher or cleaning surfaces. Um, it's also something he can help with at home and the other things he can help with at home his youth and strength are now a real asset in the family he can carry laundry upstairs it kills my back he can carry heavy shopping in from the car he's you know he's a meaningful part of the family he does more chores than my daughter actually so in conclusion johnny has a full and happy life in large part due to aba teaching him the skills he needs from the age of three He's still at the Beyond Autism, now at the um, post-19 college run by them. And of course, it's not just about college. They've also taught Johnny's dad and me and his sister how to teach him things that the school can't, private things. And by the way, his sister Marina, she's doing a master's at the moment after leaving uni, but she's also working as a part-time ABA tutor at his school. And I think she's very good at it. Um, Johnny lives at home with his family. He can do so many of the things he loves because ABA has taught him the skills he needed to do them. Restaurant dinners, swimming on Friday, 
latte on Saturday, catching a train and tube with his uncle, graduating from his a ABA college. Ooh, that's the wrong one. There should be another photo there. Never mind. I did have a photo. This is him out for a, another family event at an outdoor restaurant with his sister and his two other sisters and me and his dad. Without ABA, where would he be now? Well, he's six foot 91 kilos. If we roll back to him, if I hadn't listened to the, the mum about the ABA, he might still have the challenging behaviour. He might still have the um, lack of speech, lack of ability to communicate. I think I probably know where he'd be now. And it might be somewhere like Winterbourne View, which would have broken all our hearts. Um, so in conclusion, I think ABA rocks. I think it leads to meaningful, not token, meaningful inclusion in the real world, the world as it is, the big, beautiful, noisy and changing world. And I'm going to leave that photo up um, as we move to Q&A so that you can see Johnny taking part in normal and fun family life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane. That was an incredible presentation. I'm still a bit choked up from those pictures. Um, really really meaningful inclusion as you mentioned um so thank you so much um please uh, there's a there's a question um if there's any questions just type them in um yeah so uh, jane one question that that i was thinking as as you sp spoke um is around the some some um Sometimes, how would you respond to the, the critique that people have about ABA? You, you did mention it to some extent, but how, how have you uh, dealt with that? Because uh, there's some very strong critiques and people are listening, um, especially when that critique comes from adults who are on the autism spectrum themselves. How do you respond other than <laughs> listening to your presentation? But what would you say to them? Carola, I've been responding to some quite nasty versions of what you describe for um, about nine years, because my ABA Access for All campaign has been on Twitter, horrible place, and Facebook. And um, I have been called a child abuser, a Nazi. I mean, luckily I'm 58 years old and I'm tough as old boots, but I have been taking abuse from people who frankly don't understand Johnny's journey, don't understand ABA, and have no lived experience of either. And I think one of the problems with the autistic perspective is that no one autistic person can really speak to any autism but their own. Mm. That is such a very different condition for every single person. And level one autism and level three are chalk and cheese. So often I'm being abused by people who wouldn't know ABA from a hole in the ground, nor would they know severe autism from a hole in the ground. And most of the time, I've, in the initial years, I tried to fight back and tried to explain, look, they've taught Johnny to talk. They've taught Johnny, the ABAs have taught Johnny patiently and kindly to do his own jabs. And I tried to reason and I tried to articulate. But I realized, actually, that's not what Twitter's all about or Facebook. People just want a ruck. And in mm. the end, I don't want a ruck anymore. I'm bored of it. But I did try for many years to, to, to try and reasonably have a debate. But there was no appetite. On, on their side for a debate. It, it's almost become a part of the canon of certain elements of Twitter neurodiversity. Thou must hate ABA. And there was no thing, there was no desire to listen to what I had to say. The only time at which I fought back very strongly was when they came after Johnny. An, an anonymous anti-ABA account actually had a go at Johnny on Twitter. And that is really kicking down. And their their gist was Jane McCrady, who sits on the UK SBA board, thinks ABA is fabulous, yet her son can still only talk in two word phrases and can still only do this and only do that. And I thought, right, you've showed your colours there, because that shows that you don't understand any autism more severe than your own. And you don't understand what a triumph it is for Johnny to do some of these things. It's easy for all of us on this call to learn skills. We've all got normal IQs, I'm presuming, um, and not severe autism. It's easy. Teaching someone like Johnny to do his own jabs or to talk, this is this is very precise, skilled, kind teaching. So in answer to your question, I've tried to have the debate, <laughs> but I've sort of um, given up the debate and I just use my trusty block button now because I'm, 
and I feel like there has been a change in the attitude of ABA in the UK. I mean, most of the ABA schools in the UK, sadly, a lot of them only in England. I know there's not enough in Scotland or Northern Ireland. Um, they're all Ofsted outstanding. You know, if Ofsted mm. can see what the good is in these schools, I think there are more Ofsted outstanding ABA schools than there are National Autistic Society schools. And right. if, if you'll note, the National Society and Ambitious About Autism both regularly employ BCBAs and ABA right. professionals, but because they're so terrified of a Twitter bashing, they call it PBS and pretend it doesn't exist. One thing I really hate in life is cowardice, and I call that cowardice. And um, so with my ABA Access for All campaign, I was trying to be for other mums, like that one mum was for me, trying to demythologize ABA, trying to teach people this could change your child's quality of life, this could really help, don't listen to the rubbish. And of course a lot of the rubbish is perpetuated by the local authorities who don't want to pay for it. So it suits them much better to have the cheapo education because ABA can be more expensive because it's run by skilled professionals and often it needs to be one-to-one -one and intensive. It suits the local authorities much more to have nice schools with colourful bean bags and nursery rhymes and not no actual teaching. But it's a, it's a false economy, of course, because at the end, at 18, they roll out of these woeful special schools with no skills and then end up in half a million pound a year residential, whereas Johnny's mm. at home. Yeah. I mean, that's that's just so true that the, um, it's it's so important. And I think as, a, as you speaking as a parent and speaking for Johnny with those pictures and videos attached is just invaluable to to the campaign to to get these kids into a, a meaningful inclusion uh, in, in this in this world. And you also pointed out the, the the fact that this world is changing because you know the, even the, the idea that voice messaging is uh, what did you call it? Voice voice clips or something? Voice note. I, well, voice notes. I didn't even know that term existed, so that's <laughs> that's how behind the world. Um, yeah. But the the um, you know it is changing, and and the, I suppose the the uh, technology for somebody like Johnny is quite helpful. That the that the technology is moving in in the direction that he can actually learn to use it. Um, I'm I'm interested. I mean. I think it's really important. It's so important to hear it from you as a parent and speaking for Johnny and legally speaking for Johnny as well, which you pointed out, I think is really important. Although I think parents speak for their children until the children are able to speak for themselves, which in Johnny's case is always going to be to, only to a certain extent. But I think you also let him speak for himself as much as possible. You're not, you're not taken over. You're letting him speak. You're teaching him to speak for himself. But what as, as a professional behavior analyst, I'm just wondering, I think a lot of our audience is professional uh, behavior analysts, and I'm wondering uh, what we can do as, from, from that side. You, you're doing the, the, you're coming at this issue from the parental side, which is obviously invaluable. But what would you advise professional behavior analysts, BCBAs, RBTs, uh, registered people with the UKSBA? What would you advise professionals? What, we, what can we do to help? Well, I mean, do what you're doing because you've got a wonderful technique. I mean, I suppose at the beginning when I, he was very young, sometimes I would find younger BCBAs in particular who maybe hadn't got kids. You know, some stuff is just mm. kids. It's not autism, you know. And, and so it's it's quite different being um, an ABA professional, seeing a child for six hours a day than living with, you know, some of the behaviours. Yeah. You didn't sleep and, you know, you're bone tired and... So sometimes just, you know, understand the mum's experience. We, we can't be perfect. We can't be running our trials perfectly because we've got to put the chicken nuggets on and we've got to reflect. <laughs> and, um, but in general, you know, it's, it, it was much, much better with the BCBAs than it was with the other professionals that I came across who just didn't seem to understand the core deficits of autism, mm -hmm. whereas the, the BCBAs I've come across um, have. And continually surprised me i mean he's at the post 19 college now and i say to my husband i don't know what they're going to turn around and say they can teach him because i never thought they could teach him his jabs so maybe mm. there's something out there that they're going to teach him that i didn't have i didn't have any expectation that he could learn and um, maybe mm. there's, there's more to come but yeah, yeah it, it's it's quite hard being a mum to a severely autistic yeah. child particularly mm. in the early years so maybe just um, always understand that would be my tip mm. 
Yeah, and I was also thinking in terms of the anti-ABA card, what uh, the anti-ABA arguments, what can we do? Because when we we can oh. speak out, we can we can. I think the, the videos work so well. I would nearly encourage people to try and get the videos, more videos out into the public to show. I mean, the salsa dancing is just priceless, isn't it? <laughs> I think the way I always argue it now is to come at the point from the point of view of Johnny's quality of life. Yeah, yeah. The skills they are teaching how I'm improving Johnny's quality of life. It's very difficult to argue against that. And if you give examples of where they've improved the quality of life, kind, patient teaching, it's not, some of it has to be rote learned. We all rote learn. We rote learn the alphabet as, as neurotypical. Some of rote, there's nothing wrong with rote learning. There's nothing wrong with some of the learning to imitate because he has deficits that he needs the skills to be taught and over taught yeah, yeah. and i think sometimes the level one autistic people all of whom i think actually went to normal mainstream school and didn't need any differentiated teaching mm. they were talking about a different thing and mm. one of the other parts of my campaigning i i'm a committee member for something called the national council for severe autism it's actually in america i'm their only mm. mem member outside america because I think we need to learn to distinguish between the autism where they can work at Microsoft and open a Twitter account yeah. and the autism of a Johnny. And mm -hmm. in no other area of disability would the arguably most mildly affected be taken as the voice for all. Yeah. It, would be, it would be like in a blind charity, the short-sighted calling the shots for the blind. I know autism isn't an illness, you're not allowed to call autism an illness, but there is something wrong with the discourse at the moment. And what's wrong is that the Johnny's voice are not coming through. Mm. Johnny wasn't given the ability to open a Twitter account and have browse, but I was. So I'm out there talking up the case for, and, and often you guys in ABA are dealing more with level two and level three autism. The level course, one yeah. didn't need the differentiated teaching. They went to normal mainstream schools. They, they learned. They got through A levels without any differentiated teaching. That is, they should check their privilege because that's a privilege. Um, mm. But actually, I don't. I try not to fight these battles anymore. I think the UK SBA is doing great work in embedding yeah. ABA into the UK establishment, such that it's seen as part of the fabric of the autism educational establishment rather than something other. And I think yeah. that's working, as we see from the Ofsted, as we see from the NHS is now embracing ABA in a major way. Mm. Um, for quite a while, every week on my Twitter, I would feature a job ad where the NHS is asking for a BCBA. Yeah. And the NHS, I mean, challenging behaviour is often the, the root of why they're using those yeah. stuff. Yeah. Behavior. But the NHS in, Brit in the UK is embracing ABA. That's the truth of it. Well, Dean, I think it's probably best just to stop on that point because it's a very positive point and, and hopefully the future will be... Uh, even more of ABA in the in the uh, statutory sector because then the expense uh, question changes as well because the staff already are employed the staff already get their wages so if those staff are ABA trained then they uh, they they're going to do good ABA and with the wages that they already get anyway so it's not ABA that's expensive it's the staff cost and if the staff that are already funded are trained in ABA then there's no additional cost. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so um, a little bit of cost and training possibly or employing BCBAs in the first place and you don't have to, even the training cost to worry about. So Jane, thank you so much for, for uh, opening up our conference this morning. It was an incredible uh, 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 story and incredible evidence for what can be done. You've done wonderfully well. Um, Johnny's a very lucky boy, a lucky, lucky young man to have a, a, a lion mum. Uh, like so many autis autistic kids have lion moms and lion dads that, that they need that fight their corner until uh, they get what, what their children need. Because ultimately, you know your son best, uh, better than anybody else in the world, you, you and your husband and the, and the family. And, um, and you love him more than anybody else in the world. Uh, and, uh, and so you will only do the very best for him. So thank you so much. And um, I hope everybody who's listened has... has uh, enjoyed the talk i'm sure they have enjoyed the talk uh, the talk is, was was uh, video recorded and will be available to anybody who registered to the conference and uh, and hasn't been able to listen because i know across the world i think it's four o'clock in the morning I've, i had some emails from people saying will this be recorded because um it's going to be so early in the morning we would love we really really want to hear jane but could we just have our sleep first as well <laughs> so um 
thank you so much. And there are some lovely comments here. You can see them, Jane, uh, from people thanking you for your uh, for your talk and for your contribution. Invaluable. Okay. Thanks very much. It's a, it was a pleasure. Thank you.